Good morning, church. I'm so glad that you could worship with us today. We are going to be studying a really, really powerful message. It is about God and how grumbling and complaining can lead to an awful situation. Our scripture reading is Numbers 16, verses 9 and 10. Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to serve them, and that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi with you, and are you now seeking the priesthood also? And we call this, or they call this, Korah's Rebellion. Now Korah was the ringleader, and he was Moses' cousin. His co-conspirators were Dathan and Abiram. They were all leaders. They were men of distinction and quality who should have been set an example for the people. Instead, they were spreading their discontent among the people. They gathered together 250 followers. Sin loves company. My Bible says, woe to the wicked man and woe to his neighbor who is in danger of being infected by him. Their complaint was that Aaron and his family were appointed to the priesthood. They felt that this was, and I put this in quotes, an honor too great for Moses to give and an honor too great for Aaron to accept. Of course, Korah felt that he could do a better job of leading the people. Inappropriate ambition is greed in disguise. When God appoints people to certain positions of authority in the church, it is no small thing. God knows us inside out and upside down. He has examined us fully, checked out our hearts, and knows exactly the why of everything we do. This is what it says about the priesthood in Hebrews. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. That's Hebrews 5, 4. Korah and his followers came straight to Moses and Aaron, and they said, we're all holy. So what gives you the right to exalt yourselves above the congregation? Korah was right. They were all holy. They were all set apart for the work of the Lord. He had purified them. In Numbers 8, verses 13 and 14, God said, Have the Levites stand in front of Aaron and his sons, and then present them as a wave offering to the Lord. In this way, you are to set the Levites apart from the other Israelites, and the Levites will be mine. That's what the Lord said. The Levites were to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Serving God is an honor in whatever capacity you serve him. You know, the scripture says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Anyone can go through the motions of doing church work, but a holy person's heart must be connected to God. He must reverence God and respect the standards of living that God sets forth in his character and in his word. If you question the will of God, the Lord's response might be, get thee behind me, Satan. 
Cora was showing the characteristics of a false teacher. Pride, selfishness, jealousy, greed, lust for power, and disregard for the will of God. God is love. It is this godly love that must be exhibited in our behavior when living a holy life. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And love never fails. My Bible says the path to open rebellion against God begins with dissatisfaction and skepticism then moves to grumbling about both God and our present circumstances. Next comes bitterness and resentment, followed finally by rebellion and open hostility. If you are often dissatisfied, skeptical, complaining, or bitter, beware. These attitudes lead to rebellion and separation from God. Any choice to side against God is a step in the direction of letting him go and making your own way through life. And I tell you, you don't want to do that. In response to Korah's accusations, Moses fell on his face. He fell humbly before the Lord, asking for his help in what to do. Korah didn't know his cousin Moses at all. Korah didn't know what he was talking about. He didn't know that Moses didn't even want this leadership position. He had made excuses to God about why he couldn't do the job. That's how Aaron got involved. Korah didn't know these things. And the word says, forgive them, Lord, because they don't know what they're doing. Moses knew God like no one else. And he was afraid for Korah and his followers. So he fell on his face and prayed for himself and for them. The Lord tells us to forgive our persecutors and turn the other cheek and love our enemies. Well, Moses shows us here how to do that. He intercedes for those who stood in his face and accused him of things that they know nothing about. God encourages Moses while he's on his face. He lifts him up, giving him direction and strength to move forward. Moses tells Korah and his followers, tomorrow morning, the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near to him. Moses instructed each person to take a censer, a metal holder for incense used in worship, and place incense on it as a sign of approach to God then each would wait for God's decision. And verse 9 says, which is our focus scripture, this is Moses' response to this rebellious people. Is it a small thing to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel? to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to serve them. And that he has brought you near to himself, you and all the brethren. 
the sons of Levi with you. What God did for us was no small thing. And I would just like for you to take a moment and think of the worst thing that you have ever done. Just think about it for a moment. Well, God forgave you for that. He rescued us from Satan's grasp. He freed us from slavery to sin to become children of righteousness. Our response to this should be gratefulness. David says to God in Psalm 8, What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower then the angels and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When we grumble and complain about where God leads us, we are treating him with contempt. Esau treated his birthright with contempt and he lost it. Cain offered an unacceptable sacrifice to the Lord and it was rejected. And now Dathan and Abiram, the other two leaders of the rebellion, wouldn't even meet with Moses. They sent words of discord instead. And God's response to this mess? Verse 18, the next day, everyone showed up at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. They took their censers and put fire and incense on it. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, Separate yourself from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. God said, Move away because I'm about to wipe out the entire congregation. But Moses and Aaron fell down, face down, and cried out, O oh God, the God who gives breath to all living things, will you be angry with the entire assembly when only one man sins? In answer to Moses' prayer, God had mercy on them. He demanded that the people back away from the troublemakers where they would be safe. When we pray, we should be prepared for the answer. God might not correct the situation in the manner in which you think it should be corrected. His ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. The earth opened up its mouth and swallowed the rebels with their households and all the men with Korah, with all their belongings. The earth closed over them and they perished from among the assembly. My Bible says the sudden action was like that of a sinkhole that opens with great speed. Dathan and Abiram died along with their families, but God spared Korah's family, who later wrote many of the Psalms for temple worship. God has mercy on whom he will have mercy. And y'all are not gonna believe this, but the next day, 
the people whom the Lord had spared came before Moses and Aaron blaming them for the deaths of the people. Again, the Lord appeared and threatened to destroy the congregation. Moses and Aaron again fell on their faces to intercede for the people. Moses tells Aaron to take a censer and put fire on it from the altar. Put incense on it and take it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. And this is what the Bible said, For the wrath has gone out from the Lord. A plague had begun. God's wrath. It had gone out against the people. It was strong, it was powerful, and it was justified. God does not half step and he doesn't make mistakes. Verse 48 says that Aaron stood between the dead and the living and the plague stopped. But 14,700 people had died. And I'm just going to end with two scriptures. James 5, 9. Do not grumble against one another. So that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Amen.